Hello, this is Kevin Pierce with Expo, and today I'll be going over understanding OSA results. In my previous video, I talked about the four critical parameters that we look at with a optical spectrum analyzer. And so those are center wavelength, channel power, channel flatness, and optical signal noise ratio, OSNR. Now we're gonna take the basic understanding of what an OSA does and how to set it up real quick and apply it by looking at some results. So I'm gonna go ahead and go back over to my, uh, uh, my optic spectrum analyzer. And again, I'm still on the FTBX 5235. Uh, and I've already taken a, uh, a snapshot here. So this is one we did previously. So I'll just do another one uh, just so we have a fresh one. So essentially what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna do a quick auto discovery. So I'm gonna do a single acquisition and just one count. And I'm gonna go over to auto uh, to discover over here on the right and then let it do a quick auto discovery. Uh, narrow down what channels are available and then zoom in on it. And so we see that our, our one channel here, if I go over to results, we can start analyzing data. So right now I don't, I don't have any pass fill threshold set. So as before, we'll go ahead and set that up. I'll go to the analysis setup, go to favorites. If I have one created by the organization, I will load that. Otherwise I'll get in here and just choose ITU 100 gigahertz because again, that is what I used on my DWDM source to generate that signal. I go ahead and hit okay, and then it'll apply this channel lineup against my results. And so now we see the pass fails, so we can start analyzing. So if I'm just doing a quick snapshot, uh, you know, to, to do some troubleshooting or to get a baseline of what everything looks like, this is what I'm seeing right here. And so uh, this is channel seven, which is also uh, channel 20 in the ITU list. Um, and then there's the wavelength that it's at, the integrated signal power. So we'll talk about that. Optical signal noise ratio. And of course, I'm right in front of the transmitter. So I have a nice OSNR at 47. Uh, typically, we start seeing uh, organizations look at adjusting this, uh, this figure on the C side as you get closer and closer uh, to the receiver. This value will change. And so for a 10 gig system, we might see something around... Uh, 10 to 15 or in that range, you know, really depending on uh, uh, your needs, the type of equipment, the code modulation, all of that. And so the higher the value, the better. Uh, so typically I like to see up in the 15 to 20 uh, dB range, uh, but this will vary depending on your, uh, um, on your needs. And so that's the OSNR there. And then we have the noise. And so this is where the IEC noise is detected. So we use an IEC method to detect the noise floor. And the noise floor is at neg 53.29. And this is not a rotom, so this is just a, a standard single channel. And so this red line here is our noise floor. It was detected. So when we do OSNR, we're taking the, the signal at the peak here and then essentially just measuring this OSNR value here. So that's how we measure the OSNR, and that's this number here. If we're looking at the signal power, the signal power is essentially what we have here, right? So this is the signal power, which comes in at neg 5.88. And so now you're starting to get a better idea of, of, of how these measurements are made. And then of course, center wavelengths, smack dab, you know, uh, dab down the middle here, where we see that little down arrow. And so this is what we're looking at as far as the makeup of it. Um, if I wanna get into the, the channel results, so I'll select channel results here, and then now we can drill down and look at it from kind of a table point of view. So all the same values are here. We'll see that they're green. Uh, we can see our, what our bandwidth is at uh, full width, half maximum. We won't get into the science of that right now. Uh, but essentially, you can see all the different parameters here, right? So as far as wavelength goes, if we drifted more than 0.2 dB off of center wavelength, then it would go into alarm. Obviously, we only took one snapshot. Um, and this uh, laser was not drifting at all, so we're in good shape. That's what these blue indicator bars up here mean. If we're starting to get into another channel, this would turn yellow, and, and uh, that's not what we want, or it's kind of an orange color, I believe. Um, and so that's what we see here. If I wanted to take more acquisitions, I could. So I could drop down from the acquisition type, you know, to go to averaging, and then we can get more averaging information. But just based on the results that we have here, I'm really happy with what I'm seeing here. Uh, I don't have a lot of wavelength deviation, and so 0 0.009 nanometers off of center wavelength. So I'm really right in line with, with my expectations there. I have good signal power. 
Now, obviously, this is only a single channel, so there's really not much comparison we can do versus other wavelengths. But if I were to, say, open up a, uh, a saved trace here from our sample files, so I'm just going to go in here, and we see there's a lot of different types of saved traces here. I'm just going to grab one from a WDM system, and I'll open it up. And then this will show us more channels here. So obviously you can see we have a much greater noise floor here, right? So this is all the noise floor right here. This is a noise floor here. Um, or rather not noise floor, but noise. The noise floor is right here, this little red line. So you kind of see where the, where the, you know, where the noise floor is. So there's been a lot of amplification. You see the optical signal noise ratio is not as good as we were seeing before. This one happens to be an in-band measurement. So I don't want to confuse it too much. In-band is because of a rotom. So these signals were reshaped. But from just an analysis perspective, it's, there's, there's still some value here. So we're looking at, you know, all the different channel powers across the board to see how flat they are. Anything under this dotted line will not be called a peak. And so we see this one down here is not being identified because it doesn't have enough power. Um, so this will give you an idea of what, you know, a, a WDM system looks like with multiple channels in there and how you can look at all the different signal powers and OSNRs kind of check for that flatness, you know, that we're looking for. Um, and so this is, a, again, a WDM system. If I were to go back in uh, and just do another quick snapshot of our signal, we can go back to our signal channel stuff, and then we can talk about analyzing results um, and looking at real-time measurements to kind of, you know, use the, uh, the OSA to adjust signal powers and balance your system uh, manually if you have VOAs, you know, the little... Uh, variable attenuators, then you can tweak those and watch it in real time. And so if I go under acquisition here, again, we have the three options, signal, uh, single just for a quick snapshot, average, so you get multiple shots, so you get a better average, uh, a little bit more accurate uh, readings there. And then of course we have real time. So real time, if I just leave the same settings alone and hit start, then we can start looking at this signal in real time. And so right now that's what it is in real time. So if I were to pinch the fiber a little bit, so like I'm, I'm padding it with an attenuator, so I'll try to simulate that, you know, you'll start to see a drop in the signal. Uh, and so as it keeps scanning and it keeps scanning and it keeps scanning, you know, as it sees that power drop, and it's very subtle, I'm not really pinching it very much, uh, you can start to see it, you know, go down and down. And so now we're starting to really see some results here. And you're not noticing it, but on the scale, we're actually down quite a bit. Now we're, we're well below... Um, minus 30 dBAM. And so if I were to release it, it should pop all the way back up to neg eight. And you'll see down here in the signal power how it adjusted, right? And so this is how you are adjusting it in real time. So this allows you to do uh, analysis, um, clean a connector and see how it affects the system, you know, those types of things. Uh, so that's a really, really powerful troubleshooting and turn up tool uh, in, in real time. And again, you know, the analysis is just in real time. So it's the same places, same locations, uh, same information. Obviously, you won't have all everything uh, because some of it's averaged. Uh, but this is all in real time. And so if I stop that, if we wanted to do a drift measurement and analyze that, we can do that next. So again, just like I mentioned before, go to mode, go to drift. And then once I'm in drift, I can set up the acquisition. And drift is very useful to look at your signal over time right? What it looks like over time. So I want to do a single shot. And then I'm going to go in there on a the drift setting and say, you know what, I want to do a single shot every 10 seconds for one minute. Uh, ideally, what I would probably do here is do a single shot over the course of say four hours or 12 hours or 24 hours, whatever you want to do. And then just set the sampling and the delay, you know, to, to whatever preference makes sense for that time. And this one here, because I want to get some results pretty quickly, I'm going to, you know, set it for very short. And then I'm going to go ahead and hit start. And then it'll start that acquisition. And I'm going to grab that fiber again. I'm going to, and again, I'm going to pinch it. So I'm going to let it do its, 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 uh, its first acquisition. And then sometime during that, I will pinch the fiber so we can add some historical data in there. And so as soon as that first bit of result pops up, we can uh, start manipulating the fiber. And there it is, we see it 1561.408. We're getting green across the board based on the thresholds that were set. Uh, and then the maximum right now and the minimum is, is, the same, is roughly the same. So I'm gonna add a 
fairly decent pinch in the fiber here. So the next time it does an acquisition, we'll see some adjustments here. And now you see the next acquisition here, our minimum and maximum have, have adjusted a little bit um, you know, on the scale. And over time, we can chart this graph. Um, in one minute, we're not getting a lot of historical data, uh, but obviously we're not gonna see it here for 24 hours while I do that. And so if you look at the information that gets populated here so far, we see this is the reference trace. And right now, this is the maximum. Minus, minus 6.48 dBm was the maximum. The minimum was minus 12.75 on the power. So that's where I pinched it. You can also see the minimum maximum drift of the center wavelength and the changes in OSNR, right? Because attenuation does affect OSNR. Um, and if I wanted to get into a channel graph, I'll go up here to the top, select a channel graph, and then this is where you can see the historical information. So you can see where I pinched it right here based on the timeline. You can see how that affected OSNR, how it affected signal power, and then you can see the drift of the wavelength. So imagine running this for 24 hours on a system that is intermittent or causing chronic issues. You can watch this. And then you'll notice that, hey, you know, right at 2 p.m., the laser starts to drift quite a bit. And then in that situation, you realize what's going on at 2 p.m. So you show up at 2 p.m. And this actually happened at a site I was at once where the sun would hit the metal door at a certain time of the day. And it was so hot, I was maintaining a remote site out in the desert, the door started to heat up, which caused the room to start to get a little warmer. And so we had a pocket of hot air behind the equipment and the optics were, were getting hotter and hotter. So we're getting thermal issues. And because of those thermal issues, the laser started to drift a bit. And as the sun moved, the HVACs would, over, would compensate for the, the heat and then the problem would go away. And so this is an example of where drift testing uh, would be useful for um, really, you know, doing some advanced troubleshooting. And really, you were just looking at those four critical parameters. It, it's really not rocket science. The technology behind it may be rocket science, but uh, the actual interpretation of the results isn't. And so if I go back to a single test in WDM, um, back as a reference again, we'll talk about some of the settings that, that, that I use and some of the... the uh, the wording that I use. And so when we looked at channel results, one of the things that I talked about was this integrated power. So you have the signal power here. It has this, this, uh, these parentheses with the letter I in there. This means that we're measuring the, the signal power using integrated signal power. And so you can change some of these settings, you know, within uh, uh, preferences, within analysis setup, uh, you can change some of these results. You can, uh, you know, I haven't show you the, uh, the spectral unit based on uh, terahertz rather than nanometers. Instead of channel names, you go by channel numbers, uh, you know, those types of things on the display side. And on the analysis setup side, this is where you can change the way that you're looking at the results. In this situation, I used a, a uh, preloaded channel list, but you can create your own. In fact, you can go out there and scan your network, an existing network with eight channels on there, and then save that as a channel list. So then, and so the next time you you uh, you know you you analyze that system, you can have a channel list based on what you deploy, and have some custom parameters in there based on how much you allow it to drift, what the signal level should be at the receiver, and what they should be at the transmitter, what they should be after the first EDFA, after the second EDFA, those types of things, right? And so uh, using favorites, it automatically set that for me. If you wanted to set your own channel list, this is where you would do it. You would select the channel width, 100 gigahertz, 50 gigahertz, whatever, and then signal power calculation. There's three different ones, integrated signal power. Integrated signal power is the most accurate method to analyze signal power for highly modulated systems. Uh, this is really valuable and much more accurate way to measure power, particularly in a cable TV system, is integrated signal power. So when you start looking at things like peak signal power and total signal power, you know, we're starting to look at, you know, uh, power values that include the noise, that don't include the noise uh, within a certain uh, uh, portion of the spectrum, those types of things, right? Uh, so you can get in here and automatically, uh, not automatically, but manually set up parameters, how far you want to be offset on the, on the central wavelength, or you can create one, add it as a favorite, and just use that one over and over again. 
Um, and, and so that's some of the, the, the power, you know, behind this. And then at that point now, all we do is just look at results. So I get into the channel results here. Um, I load my favorites or I create my own favorites and then analyze the results. Um, and even if I don't have a channel favorite, I can just get in there and say what my deviation is. And typically we see between 0.02 to 0.05, depending on your organization and, uh, um, you know, the values, you know, recommended there. And power levels will vary depending on where you're at, as will the OSNR. And so that's something that you really need to realize. It's very important to understand where you're at in the network, what's contributing to the noise, how much attenuation you have, how many connectors, um, how many amplifiers in particular, and all those things come into place to really give you a better idea of that. And, and really looking at these four critical parameters will help you understand the quality of your network. And when it comes to you know, looking at all of this, um, when I'm looking at something like central wavelength, then I know that, you know, if I'm not drifting too much, that my receiver is going to detect my signal, that I'm not going to bleed over into an adjacent channel. We don't want that at all, right? So you're, you're checking for faulty transceivers, you're checking for, uh, you know, for issues with your filters, those types of things. Uh, that's where center wavelength will allow you to do. Channel power will tell you what the power level is at that channel. Um, and that will vary depending on the receiver sensitivity. So as long as you fall within the re receiver sensitivity, then your channel power will be good. Then there's channel flatness again. And channel flatness is looking at all the channel powers to see if there's any channels that are using more powers than the other, right? This could uh, really uh, be from an imbalanced amplifier. Uh, it could be from a dirty connector. And so it's important to, to look at channel flatness to, to see how even everything is. And then, uh, um, then we have OSNR. And so OSNR, optical signal noise ratio, the quality of your signal. And probably the single uh, greatest parameter to determine the performance of a link is a bit error rate test if you're on a, uh, um, on a system that, uh, that you can test that. And so that is probably the single uh, greatest uh, test to do performance link, you know, to, to look at the performance of your link. But a lot of that is dis determined principally by the OSNR. And so if you have high OSNR, that will affect your bit error rate uh, at some point. And so, you know, qualifying a network to see how healthy the signal is, is, is critically important. And the optical spectrum analyzer and understanding how to analyze the results is a big part of that. It's a big part of that. And that's pretty much it in a nutshell. That's uh, understanding also results. My name is Kevin Pires. Thank you very much.